I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Aubrey de Grey, President and CSO at the LEV Foundation and co-founder at the SENS Research Foundation. Dr. de Grey is the author of the Mitochondrial Free Radical Theory of Aging and co-author of Ending Aging. He's one of the world's leading experts in longevity research, an international adjunct professor of the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, a fellow of the Gerontological Society of America, the American Aging Association, and also the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. Dr. de Grey has a BA in computer science, studies in bioinformatics, and a PhD in biology from the University of Cambridge. So, Aubrey, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. It, well, thanks it, for having me on the show. Yeah, it, it's truly an honor to be able to interview you. I mean, you're, again, your work in longevity research is legendary. So let me start out by asking about your current anti-aging work as the founder of the Longevity Longevity Escape Velocity Foundation. Can you tell me a little bit about what your current organization is doing and its focus? Sure, yeah. So um, like the organizations that I've led in the past, LEV Foundation has quite a lot of different activities going on. Uh, we are doing quite a bit in the advocacy space, um, more than I have in the past, really, because kind of the time is right for that. Um, so uh, the two main things we're doing there right now are we are supporting a 501c4, a lobbying group called the Alliance for Longevity Initiatives, uh, which is very energetic in Congress. And we are also supporting something called the Health Span Action Coalition, which is more of a um, uh, grassroots uh, advocacy organization representing and uh, 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 focusing on the priorities of the older generation, uh, but from a medical point of view with a message of you know hope that we can actually make progress in that kind of area. So that's on the advocacy side. Um, but of course, we're also mainly a research organization and we have two main projects at the moment. One of them is we have seed funded a, um, a, a very interesting company called Kynice, which is working on a very new and extremely promising way to cryopreserve organs and tissues. Uh, we have a great interest in that for organ transplant purposes and also for cryonics. Uh, but our main project, very much our flagship project, is a mouse life extension project <clears throat> in which we are taking a large number of mice, a thousand mice actually, and we are giving them combinations of four different life extending interventions. Um, this is a really unprecedentedly ambitious project. No one's ever done anything like this before. The things that really make it so unique are number one, we're starting relatively late in life, uh, in middle age, um, which is something that isn't done nearly enough. Number two, as I mentioned, we're combining therapies. We've got four different therapies and different groups get different subsets of those therapies. And perhaps the most important thing of all is that the therapies by and large are damage repair therapies. They are rejuvenation therapies, um, which are typically not just uh, um, able to be supplied in the in the diet, which is what most people have restricted themselves to when they're doing studies like this, um, but rather, you know, injections, because uh, gene therapy is involved in some cases, stem cell therapy and so on. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a very ambitious project. Uh, but you know, that's why people give me money is because they want ambitious things done. Um, so, um, so we're very excited with this. Uh, it's the project's just starting, and uh, we were hope well, we are hoping that we'll be able to do um, subsequent rounds of the same kind of thing with different treatments uh, at least once a year. But of course, that rather depends on how much funding we can bring in because these experiments are very expensive. Probably each round will cost around three million dollars. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. But yeah, again, I mean, it, it's the, the scope of your work is just truly amazing. So I, I definitely come back to the experiments in a minute, but I, I wanted to touch on the companies again prior to LEV, which is what you're doing now. You were the co-founder of the SENS Research Foundation. So that, that started back in 2009 and it's still active today. So one of the things I wanted to ask about was how are these organizations differentiated from each other? And then what led you to found LEV? Because it seems like the focus is so close to sense. 
Really close. So, um, and of course, uh, Sense Foundation was not the first organization I led, where before that, starting in 2003, I co-founded the Methuselah Foundation with Dave Goebel, yeah. and that's also still going. So um, all three organizations have their own kind of uh, specific identity, so to speak. Um, the reason we created Sense Research Foundation in 2009 was because at Methuselah we had two rather different activities. We were doing uh, prizes for mouse longevity and such like as a kind of PR exercise. And we were also doing research and we felt eventually that the, it was best to do those two things in separate organizations, though they kind of um, ended up um, doing both, both, both organizations doing both in the end, really. Um, as for the latest development, well, really, I would regard LEV Foundation as a progression from what Sense Research Foundation did and does. At Sense, in 09, remember that was in the days before the hallmarks of aging paper had come out, and when basically hardly anybody really believed in damage repair as a way to um, as a way to proceed against aging. So, at Sense, the goal was to make rejuvenation respectable, so to speak, and to pursue individual aspects of that, individual damage repair approaches that we were focusing, of course, on the ones that were most difficult and were not being done by other people, um, but it, as it really individual separate projects. And now, uh, you know, rejuvenation has very much um, become respectable, and uh, I, I don't have to justify it anymore in the... <laughs> Uh, to, to other experts. Um, but the thing that we're doing with the mouse lifespan project that I just described is something that really, you know, no one else is going to do, even at Sense Research Foundation, um, because it's just like combining things doesn't really fit the, the incentive structure of academia or, for that matter, um, of industry, you know, because different bits are owned by different people or some of it's not patentable at all or whatever. Um, and at Sense Research Foundation, they're still doing, you know, mostly individual projects. So there's one project going on there that is a kind of stepping stone towards what we're doing at LEV Foundation, but mostly it's not that. So that's just really the difference. Oh, yeah. Well, and that does make sense, right? It's sometimes it's easier to start something new rather than try and change things and pivot midstream. So that, yeah, that makes complete sense. Um, so, I mean, going back to, again, SENSE, that came out of the Strategies for Engineered Negligible Senescence. This was a proposal of yours back in 2005. And again, you have been in this for many years doing incredible work. But it, I remember when that one hit the news, that was a big deal when that came out, even back then. And it was a range of therapies you were proposing to repair age-related damage to human tissue. So has that strategy, that, that SENS strategy changed in the 17 years since you first proposed it? I mean, I, I'm sure that it has, but it has, has it been more of an evolution or has there been kind of a sea change where you've said, you know, you know what, this was good, but we need to go this direction because it's better? So there has been an evolution, but it's been really only at the level of the details. So if actually the real origin of sense was in the year 2000. And the first paper that um, that I published describing it was in 2002. But as you say, it kind of hit the mainstream media around uh, around 2005. Um, uh, but yeah, so um, really, the, the main thing that's happened since then is that um, new discoveries have been made that essentially have provided shortcuts or improved versions of the um, original therapies that I was proposing. Um, for example, we now have um, synolytics, uh, drugs that selectively kill senescent cells. Back in 2000, 2005, that was inconceivable. And the way that I was talking about getting rid of senescent cells involved a rather sophisticated technique called suicide gene therapy, which is still not stupid, mm. but it's a lot harder than, a lot more elaborate than a small molecule. Similarly, uh, we've now got CRISPR, for example, uh, for gene editing, which is something that, uh, you know, again, you know, no one had conceived of it in the year 2000 or 2005. Um, even um, induced pluripotent stem cells were only first um, discovered in 2006. So um, you know, all of these tools have come along and provided ways in which these various um, therapies that I was proposing back then um, might be done a little bit more easily than um, 
than I was thinking back then. But what has not happened is the discovery of any new kind of damage that doesn't fit into the categories, the seven deadly things, as I call them, um, and, and thus needs a whole radically new approach to, uh, to dealing with them. Yeah, yeah, well, it, and again, I, it's, it's remarkable. One of the things that strikes me is there's, I guess, um, I would say it appears that people are either following this and excited about it, or else they have very little knowledge about it. It doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of a middle ground there. And just from people that I've talked to, you know, it's, it's one of those topics where you mention life extension, anti-aging, and people get really excited, or else they say, what? That, that's possible that's moving forward you know so you know the the send strategies again when you first proposed those i got really excited about that a lot of the people that a lot of my colleagues and friends got really excited about that but i still meet people all the time when i'm talking about health stuff who were just completely mystified so uh from a biological perspective you've been quoted as saying the set of accumulated side effects from our metabolism itself will eventually kill us. And so if I understand that correctly, when I was reading through trying to do show notes, uh, what you were saying basically is that our bodies just build up these substances like amyloid, cholesterol, and lipofuscin that eventually poison us from within, right? Is that still kind of the main type of damage that we're looking at reversing? Um, it's it, it's it's a subset of the types of damage. So yes, the body aging consists of, as you say, the accumulation of various types of self-inflicted damage that are consequences of the network of processes that the body has to perform all the time in order to keep us alive. Um, some of those types of damage are of the sort that you described, waste products that accumulate either inside cells or outside. Some of them are more changes to the um, molecular structure of useful molecules. So the main thing is that we lose elasticity of the lattice of proteins called the extracellular matrix, which gives our tissues their uh, physical properties. And that's got various problems like presbyopia, not being able to see things close up, uh, but also life-threatening things to do with the major arteries. Um, but then also there are um, types of damage that are more at the cellular level rather than the molecular level. And in some yeah. cases that means um, cells, bad, cells getting into a bad state in one, of one kind or another and, we, and getting um, you know, overly abundant. So I just mentioned senescent cells already um, uh, that we now have drugs that can selectively kill. Um, but also, of course, cancer cells count in that as well. And then finally, the simple loss of good cells. So if you have, for example, not enough stem cells of a particular type, then you may not be able to make enough of a particular type of um, non-stem differentiated cell. Um, so Parkinson's disease would be an example of a type of an aspect of aging that is mainly driven by that kind of damage. So, yeah, so they come under a variety of different categories. Yeah, yeah. Well, and so in terms of aging, and again, without getting in too deep, because I don't want to lose, you know, most of the audience, but, um, you know, I, I, I want to look at some of the demographics that are involved here. The baby boomers are currently between 58 and 76 years old. And I've read that this aging demographic is driving a lot of this research into longevity and anti-aging medicine. I mean, obviously, your work has continued in this progression, but in terms of funding and support for it, it seems like this demographic aging is putting support behind that. Um, now, so in the next seven years, all of these boomers will be at least 65 years old. Do you see this creating a boom in anti-aging research? It's hard to say. Um, if I look at the age spectrum of the people who have been major contributors to this uh, movement so far, it's it, it, it actually spans a wide range. What I don't tend to see, however, is very many people who are over the age of 65 putting serious money in. It's more as if kind of people like that have, um, I don't know, given up or um, uh, they've spent too much of their lives being told by the whole world that aging is yeah. not, not a medical problem and is woven into the fabric of the universe and we've just got to live with it. Um, um, you know, so I don't get many, <clears throat> many big donations from people of that kind of demographic. People who are in like their 40s or so, 40s or 50s, um, have often been um, uh, among the people doing this, perhaps because they have enough money um, and uh, uh, to, to be able to give some away or to invest in something very early stage and high risk. Um, 
And certainly that's where most of the money's come from until now. Well, in, in, until, uh, let's say, a few years ago. A few years ago, a um, big thing happened, though, because quite a lot of people started to make uh, serious money in cryptocurrencies. And um, a lot of those people are very young. They're in their 20s. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, a, a number of those people have now started donating quite substantial amounts uh, to, um, to, to various of the organizations involved. And of course, it's not just about donations. It's also about investments. Um, there are quite a few companies out there that are now very well funded that are doing um, important work in this area. The nonprofit sector, however, has a vital role still to play, uh, simply because there are things that are just pre-investable or maybe just not investable at all, really, but absolutely vital nevertheless. Interesting. Interesting. You know, it seems like you're touching on so many psychological factors that affect people. And this is one of the things that I've wondered about as well. Uh, I've, I've spoken with, and again, just in terms of general health, but, um, you know, when I, when I've talked to people about anti-aging medicine, uh, I've, I've had several people say to me, why would I want to live longer in a body that's in decline in a body that's breaking down? And that always gives me pause. I think, well, wait a minute. No, that that's not the idea, right? Like as I, I believe uh, Dr. David Sinclair has popularized the term health span, right? It's not just increasing longevity, it's increasing, you know, usable years of good health, you know, and the work that you do seems like it directly contributes to that. It's not just about making people longer. It's, it's making people live healthier, happier, longer lives, right? So. Well, that's absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, and the thing is that David and I and everyone else in the field has been saying this, you know, loudly for a very long time. You know, uh, we've been saying, look, this is all about this is aging is a medical problem. We are medical researchers. We are um, seeking to stop people from getting sick. And, you know, what's not to like about that? And, so many, and yet so many people, as you say, just don't want to hear that. They want to carry on believing that this is all about something that they don't really want anyway, namely, you know, living a long time in a body that's biologically old. Yeah. Uh, we, honestly, you know, it's, it's a bit of a mystery. Why, it's very frustrating for people like David and myself and the others who are out there, you know, talking to the general public a lot, um, why there is such a determination not to hear what we're saying about that yeah yeah you know i think it goes to uh, i think it goes to a lot of social identity right in terms of families and generations and aging and roles and i i think it also goes to how people see themselves mm -hmm. and and also i think that the promise of what this could provide is so big that people don't really want to look at it because it's kind of scary, right? Like, uh, you know, maybe, maybe there's this worry that, you know, I don't want to get excited about this because it might not happen. And I would feel so let down. Those are, those are just some things that have kind of occurred to me, but I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. People know that aging is this absolutely ghastly thing. They also know that we can't do anything about it yet. And so <clears throat> even if they, hear that we may be able to do something about it at some point in the future, but I also know that exactly how far in the future is something that nobody knows, and therefore they don't want to get their hopes up. Yeah. Well, so in terms of average American lifespan, right now that's holding at 77.8 years old, and demographers have claimed that the maximum possible, and I think that this was kind of math-based, but they were saying it was about 122.5 years. So that's almost a doubling there. Do you think that the boomers as a group have a reasonable chance of approaching that 122.5 years or is the medicine not going to be there for them? Well, so first of all, as you say, this number 122 and a half is just a number uh, that has been extrapolated from data from the past. And in fact, that's the age of the person, the, the, the world record holder at the moment. Um, so saying that one can't get beyond that, or let's say saying one can't get beyond 130, which is what most demographers would say, is not a statement about what we can do with future medicine. It's about what we can do without future medicine mm. in the situation when we have um, only people having the access to what they have had access to in the past, which is, of course, not what we're talking about at all. So there's no actual limit whatsoever to how long people can live or live healthily, live youthfully um, in the context of medicine that has not yet been developed. Um, however, in the, the question, as you say, is 
do people who are already in middle age have any chance of benefiting from these, these medicines that are coming along? And of course, that depends on how soon they come along. At this point, I think things are going pretty damn well, and that we have a respectable chance, at least a 50-50 chance, of developing medicines that decisively um, rejuvenate people and really get to this um, threshold that I've called longevity escape velocity. Um, where people are not people are simply not getting biologically older anymore uh, as they're getting chronologically older. Um, I think we've got a respectable chance of getting there within the next 15 years, maybe even a little sooner. Um, <clears throat> so, um, you know, that would certainly be in time for at least the biologically younger of the middle aged, the people who are in middle age now. Yeah, yeah. Well, and again, in terms of that health span, you know, I, I want to address briefly the, the, the financial incentives for anti-aging medicine, because the annual medical costs are around roughly $2,000 uh, per year for younger people, right? And, you know, when you get into that 65 and older age range, it starts to push more towards $11,000 per year on average, right? If people get into major surgeries, they get into assisted care. There are so many age-related medical costs. And many of those come back to society as a whole, right? They're, they're a burden on the system. And of course, they're a burden on the younger generations also. Right. So, you know, it, it seems like not only is your research providing tangible health benefits to individuals, again, increasing health span, increasing longevity, also in a larger context, this has the potential to massively reduce the costs and basically take a lot of that, the labor and development and care that's going into taking care of the aging and start to redirect that into other areas. You're totally right. Yeah. The, um, I mean, the, it's not just in the US, of course, worldwide, even in the developing world, um, aging is now the number one problem in, med in medical problem because every country in the world has uh, an average lifespan more than 50 now. Almost every country is more than 60, um, which means that absolutely the uh, therapies that we're talking about that would stop people from suffering the health problems of late life would, even if they were quite expensive initially, which they probably will because everything is initially, um, you know, even then they would totally pay for themselves many, many times over really quickly. Um, there's, a, a, there's a phrase that's been used to describe this. It's called the longevity dividend. Uh, this is a phrase that's been around for decades and it's been used, um, you know, and, uh, this argument has been made very um, articulately and, and, and cogently to policymakers and decision makers around the world for decades. And they haven't, it hasn't made the slightest difference to um, public policy. Here's why. The people who are listening to this, they will say, yes, we understand the maths. We understand that if we were able to develop these medicines, then there would be an enormous financial gain. But what you're asking us to do is to invest such and such a number of billions of dollars in research in order to get this trillions of dollars of benefit in due course. But that only happen if the research actually succeeds. And we, of course, know that aging is not a disease and can't be fixed with medicine. And therefore, we're not going to give you the money because it's not going to actually deliver what you're talking about. And of course, now um, we're not quite in that position anymore. Historically, you know, people who were studying the biology of aging just didn't have the guts to come out and say, listen, um, you know, we 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 confidently predict that this will actually work to this extent in this amount of time. And, um, you know, when I started doing exactly that, everyone ran away very fast. Uh, you know, they didn't really want anything to do with these time frame predictions because they were thinking, oh dear, this, this sounds like over promising and under delivering, and we don't want to do that. And I said, that's nonsense. Um, you know, we have a duty to make these time frame predictions or else everyone's just going to not listen. Um, and now it's changing. Uh, it's not just me anymore. Uh, you know, people are out there saying that we are within striking distance. And that's why we are now having much more intelligent and potentially productive conversations with people in the corridors of power. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, another thing that I've seen that I think kind of goes to this, and again, the psychology is such a, a big aspect of this, is, uh, you know, there are 
biological natural organisms that don't age, right? Or they age slowly or they regenerate enough that they effectively don't age. So like uh, the immortal jellyfish, I believe was one. There's another one called sturdy turtles and then planarian worms. And that, that in the third category, when I was reading about it, it had indicated that basically they regenerate to the point where they effectively don't age. Anything that gets damaged just gets repaired rapidly and you know the organism just continues. Now, are there lessons that we can learn from them? And do you think that we can use those as examples to say, look, we can do this too? It's a very complicated question because different animals that live a long time do it for different reasons and in different ways. I should probably actually highlight um, a book that was written last year by one of my colleagues, an excellent uh, book called Methuselah's Zoo, written by Steve Orstad, who is mm. one of is a um, uh, really um, really important gerontologist, and it's a book for the general audience, so it's something I recommend. Um, it's all about the, the question you're asking. The thing is, yeah, I mean, there are some cases where we can learn something, probably, anyway. So, for example, there's a type of rodent called the naked mole rat, which lives a lot longer than other um, rodents of the similar size. And people have been studying why that would be, and there are various reasons, but one thing that definitely seems to be important is they're very, very good at not getting cancer. Um, and uh, exactly how they do that is a, an area of very um, vibrant research right now. That's one example. Um, there are, uh, birds live a lot longer than rodents of a, of a similar size, and um, that's despite the fact that they uh, have a very high um, metabolism because you know flying flying costs energy, um, and uh, exactly why that is in terms of like what the um, cells in the in the bird are doing so as not to make um, toxic molecules like free radicals. You know, this is something that again has been researched a lot. But very often, the reasons why animals, especially animals that are very primitive, live a long time or regenerate very well, is simply because they don't have the same kind of problem that we have in the first place. For example, they don't no, like the um, you know immortal jellyfish doesn't have a central nervous system. You know, and I'm quite fond of my central nervous system, so you know. I, um, <clears throat> so yeah, some, there are there are areas where we can't learn all that much, but there are some areas where we can. Oh, that that makes sense. That they're not at the level of complexity where complex systems break down and need repair, and so it's very easy to repair, like on a cellular basis. I think that's kind of what you're saying. It's kind of what I'm saying. I mean, there's one actual important point in this though that goes beyond that, which is cell division is a very um, you know, a very powerful rejuvenating process. It kind of dilutes away garbage, and it also you can it, this, it allows natural selection to get rid of mutant cells, for example. Um, however, uh, you know, our central nervous system, and not just our central nervous system, also our hearts, for example, consist of cells that are post mitotic. In other words, they simply don't divide at all. They just have lost the ability to divide. And those cells have to be long lived in order to do their job as part of the organ that they are part of. Um, and therefore, they have to just, you know, do the best they can, struggling along while slowly accumulating garbage. And when they die, you know, um, they don't get replaced, or at least they don't usually get replaced. So that's a problem that doesn't exist in organisms that grow throughout their life, like lobsters, for example, um, which are often talked about as one of the um, interesting yeah. things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, so one of the other things, and, and again, this is kind of off my questions list, but, um, you know, one of the other concerns that people have mentioned is what when you talk about, um, you know, eliminating aging and radically increasing longevity, one of the other things that people often respond with is, well, we, we already have overpopulation on Earth. It's just going to run away out of control. We're running out of resources. We have scarcity issues already, you know. And and so I, I think that there's this, this is social anxiety about that, right? Um, now, is that something that, that you've researched at all? Or Yes, it is probably the single most um, prevalent concern that people have when one talks about this whole thing. And it's frustrating because the answers to it are so obvious and so easy. Um, firstly, you know, people are only going to get older at one year per year, right? We're not going to have any thousand year old people for another 900 years, whatever happens. And quite a lot of things that are going to be true in like you know 90 years let alone 900 years are completely unknowable right now um but the main thing that really um irritates me about this overpopulation concern is that today 
the, we, we, we already have overpopulation in, this, in some sense, but not in terms of not having enough space. You know, yeah. at this point, everybody could have their own acre. And that's without even looking at places that are not nice to live, right? Um, and so the only problem is pollution, right? It's the fact that we are creating too many greenhouse gases and, you know, the, and uh, undegradable plastics and so on. And all of this stuff is being solved by other technologies right now, you know, by development of systems for removing carbon or greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Um, and, you know, bacteria that eat plastics and, um, you know, cheap desalination, all this kind of thing. So, you know, um, it's just crazy to be thinking in terms of an overpopulation problem arising from solving a medical problem that causes so much suffering. It, yeah, yeah. Well, it, you know, one of the, and one of the reasons I mentioned that, and I, I know that you're running short on time, but um, so I had actually done a story a while ago where I was talking about demographic transition in populations. And I would started this, this was back in 2015, naively, like most people, I said, oh, overpopulation, it's bad, it's going to get worse, we need to deal with this. As I started researching, I started finding papers saying that we're reaching a point of demographic transition, and it's entirely possible just through education and workforce changes and all of those things that our population may actually decline to up to tenfold in the next hundred years. And so it seems like that could potentially dovetail in with what you're doing really well. It could be, yeah. I mean, some people are certainly worried about population decline. And um, one way to stop populations from declining is to have less, have a lower death rate. Um, because you're quite right, yes, every country seems to go through this transition where once women become sufficiently educated and emancipated and so on, um, they decide to have fewer children and they decide to have those yeah. children later. Um, so yeah, the birth rate slows down. Um, uh, and yes, I, you're quite right that this could indeed dovetail. Absolutely. Well, Aubrey, let me thank you again so much for your time today. It has truly been an honor to speak with you. Your work is absolutely brilliant. And it, your name just keeps coming up again and again and again and again. So I, I'm, I'm so pleased to be able to interview you. Um, You're very kind. Let me close by asking, uh, what is coming next for you and for life extension in the near future? What should we be looking for in the headlines? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, of course, um, the reason why LEV Foundation has chosen to do this combination study on mice as its flagship project is because we have a reasonable hope that we're going to succeed. Our goal is to reach a threshold that I defined many years ago called robust mouse rejuvenation, which basically means taking mice that have maybe a year on average to live um, and doubling that making them live a, a, a total of two years longer. So that for the typical mouse strains that are used means you start when the mice are roughly a year and a half old, and they would normally live to an average of two and a half, and you take that out to three and a half. And typically the maximum that the, the oldest mice will live to maybe three and a quarter years, and we get that out to four and a quarter. Once we can do that, there are two things that we can say. Number one, there's a respectable chance that the interventions that worked in mice will be able to be translated to humans. Uh, this is, of course, your typical pharmaceutical has a rather low hit rate in terms of transmission from translation from mice to humans. But damage repair therapies, I think there's reasons to believe that the hit rate will be higher. Um, but also the rhetorical aspect is very, very important. Once you've got the ability to manipulate aging in middle aged mice, um, you know, to that extent, it becomes just completely absurd and impossible to say that, oh, aging is, you know, something that medicine will never be able to do yeah. anything about. Wonderful. Aubrey, thank you again so much for your time today, sir. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me.